I want to thank everyone who supported us today. We had people who donated for today's program at Science at Cal. We have our you know, advisory council I want to thank. We have Lawrence Hall of Science I want to thank. Um, and just all of you for being here. I just want to thank everyone for supporting our program. So thank you so much. Quick run through of how this hour is going to go. We're going to do a little bit of a trivia round at the beginning. Um, that was just a get to know your question, but we'll do a little bit more trivia. Then we'll head into Tina, Tina's talk on building a, a stronger postman, how to improve your RNA, uh, improve RNA messengers. We'll do a quick Q&A. The reason I want to say this is because you are and you are encouraged, not only allowed, you are encouraged to continue to ask questions in that Q, in the chat box throughout the entire presentation. So talk with us, talk with the people who are with us today. Then we will go in, we will go into, um, we'll ask Tina those questions. Then we'll go into another round of trivia that's going to be some questions that Nina has provided with us on bees. So get ready for some bee trivia. And then Nina will present the bees disease, how do bees get sick? We'll do another quick Q&A. So remember, keep asking those questions in that chat box. And then if we actually uh, have a chance, we will open up Q&A to people if you want to turn off your, where you're all, you all should be muted now and continue to be muted. But at some point, if you want to raise your hand, there's a, a function uh, that says, um, what is it? It's like uh, emotions or what's the reactions right. reactions i can't see it because i'm hosting reactions you can click reactions at the bottom of your screen and you will see a raise your hand function and we will call on you um if there's time and we might be able to stay a little bit extra um if there's lots of questions that come through all right we're gonna do this and do it right i'm gonna launch another poll for you guys no oh, it's so hard here we go okay i'm gonna need to move my polls around so Let's do fiat facts question number one. I'm going to launch this poll. All right, you guys. After whom in this fountain is Sproul Plaza named? Carol Christ, Lee Richter, Ludwig, Ludwig von Schwerenberg. <laughs> what is that right? Or Mario Savio. I actually got this question from the library quiz that they just put out um, called Fiat Facts. So kudos to the libraries to, for supplying me with this uh, quiz question. We'll give it maybe 60% of you. What do you think, Vetri? Sure. Yeah, 60%. Let's see if we good. can get there. I have to admit, I don't actually remember the answer to this. You told me earlier today and I, I forgot it. <laughs> <laughs> it may surprise you. Can we get a few more people? Pull, maybe like one more person okay, answering 60%, we're there. <laughs> there we go. All right. And poll, share results. Huh. Oh, Sally, you can't tell people. You can't give people the answer. <laughs> Mario Savio, no, Savio, no, it's Lug, Ludwig von Schwerenberg. Let's click here. Come out of here. I have a little in Ludwig was a local German short haired pointer who was often found relaxing in the fountain in the 1960s. According to the Daily Cow, he was briefly a candidate for ASUC president in this 1964 presidential race. He was disqualified for reasons that included failing to complete 75 units of university work. Wah, wah, wah. All right, Fiat Fact 2. I love this one too. Let's go in. Fiat Fact 2. Launch poll. Wow, recounting a student prank, a UC Berkeley library staff member told the Daily Cal in 2011. We went downstairs in the main stacks and there was a blank running around. What did she see? Uh, did I tell you this oh. one, Petri? I did. Yeah, yeah, this one I know. Uh, yep. This one, you're <laughs> this one I am familiar with. Although it's funny, I, I, I don't want to say anything, but there's something interesting going on, which I think you can tell, Dee, but everyone else will see. <laughs> All right, one more vote, maybe. One more vote. Let's see if we can get up to 60% voting. What did they see? 
don't know. Right? I might just end it here. It's not. Uh, oh, there, uh, there we you go. go. 61. All right. <laughs> Share results. We got was it a chicken D? It was a chicken. What were you going to say about the chicken veg? I was going to say that it's very funny that no one chose a baby, but then I was like, if a baby was running around, it would be a little <laughs> much, maybe. <laughs> I, I hadn't noticed. <laughs> that would be that would be interesting. That might have made the news. So yes, library staff members have reported the occasional chicken chasing as a surprising part of their duties. In the past, this is a quote, in the past, committed students have brought suitcases filled with clothing, a desktop computer, and even sneaked in a live bird, according to Alina Christian, a night shifter at, and manager at Doe Library. She said, we went downstairs in the main stacks and there was a chicken running around. After that discovery, Doe Library staff had to catch the bird and clean up its droppings. Library staff staff are still unsure why the bird was in the building but they assume it was a prank <laughs> i think that that's a good assumption let me stop oh i have a little animation of a chicken there the answer is chicken all right i'm gonna do one more know your audience so let's get into the know your audience question two launch what is the first thing you will do once the quarantine is over will you go to a science at cal event hug go to a concert travel or see friends after that intro music i wish i would have put go dancing that's yeah. what i want to be doing <laughs> i guess go to a concert with your friends that would be a nice oh we got a lot of people voting for this one <laughs> i like to comment in the chat the club is not an option <laughs> <laughs> Right. Travel. Me too. Me too. Where are you going to go, Vetri? I'm, I'm, you know, I have not been home to my parents' place in New Jersey in over a year, so I'm going to go there. It's not a very exotic place. But, I was just going to say, you might be the only person who's dreaming of New Jersey. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Where are I'm, you going to go, G? <laughs> oh, Miami. Okay. <laughs> All right, with that said, I am going to stop share and we are going to bring Tina up to share her screen. Again, make sure you're adding your questions to the chat. Tina Bajaj is a graduate student in comparative biochemistry program at UC Berkeley. Let me bring my text over here. She did her bachelor's in biochemistry and her master's in biophysics. She is a fourth year graduate student working with Niren Murthy. I hope I pronounced that right. right? Um, she is interested in translational sciences to merge the basic and clinical sciences together. So thank you for being here. Tina, take it away. Hi, everyone. I would like to thank Science at Cal for giving me this platform to share my research with you all. So the title of my presentation is To Build a Stronger Postman, Improving the Messenger's RNA. Uh, oh. So before I start my presentation, I would like to ask the question, who is the king of the cell? Anybody can answer this question? You know, king are the most powerful, who always know each and everything, who takes all the decisions. Anybody has that answer? Somebody, somebody say nucleus, any other? Mitochondria, mitochondria, genes. What do you okay. think? Tina? So some people are a little bit, oh, yeah, oh. we got DNA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. And DNA is the molecule which actually does everything, actually has every information and ha have all the instructions what is happening in the cell. So DNA knows, DNA has the information like, what would be the color of your eye? What would be the height of an individual? And what would be the color of your hair? So each and every information happening in cell or happening in your body, DNA has that information. Okay, so my next question is, who is the brother of that DNA in the cell? I'm asking this brother of DNA because 
we all have brother we all have siblings right and oh we share some characteristics or traits with our siblings right all the rna are... rna 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 yeah oh we are getting that yay great so rna is the sibling rna stand for ribonucleic acid although they are siblings but they share they have some differences dna is a double stranded molecule whereas rna is a single stranded molecule and the structural composition is a little bit different dna has deoxyribose sugar which means it has hydrogen on the two prime carbon of the ribose sugar whereas rna has hydroxyl group on the two prime carbon sugar dna has thymine whereas rna has uracil as a one of the base component so what does a mrna do anybody can answer quick answer anybody copies dna copies dna close 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 mirrors got mirrors dna, DNA. thanks vetri sorry yeah yes transcribes tells how to make protein hmm. so as i mentioned that dna is a king and mrna is his bro his brother so mrna is actually a postman since dna is a king and every king actually stays in the you know his kingdom they are not allowed to go outside to do everything they are limited with within their kingdom so what does dna do dna actually gives all the information to messenger rna which go out of its kingdom and transfers its information to the proteins proteins are the major work force of our cells who does all the events happening in the cells so we say that messenger rna mrna is a postman who takes the information from dna and delivers to the proteins so now i hope that you are able to appreciate the importance of the mrna in the cell now genetic disease let's say there is some wrong information embedded into your dna what would happen the wrong dna would give wrong message to protein right and wrong protein would lead to a genetic disease that's why we have so many diseases right so how can we treat them mrna is a genetic molecule we can treat them by injecting mrna how about if we directly inject mrna directly postman delivers right information to the proteins so if you look over here directly injection of the mrna in the cells which produces protein or secretes the protein could help a person to save its life and i think that's a great idea if mrna could be a drug for a protein replacement therapies for expression of the protein in a specific disease that's a great idea right but mrna are very unstable molecules as i mentioned in my previous uh previous slide that ribose sugar has two prime oh this is a main culprit which actually degrades rna oh attacks its phosphate backbone by itself and it degrades it it breaks the chain of the rna and your mrna is not working now in addition to that there are so many enemies present in the cell for this mrna there are two kind of ribonucleases which degrades it 
one kind of exonucleases and one kind of exon endonucleases. Exonucleases start from end of the mRNA and keep going inside, whereas endonucleases cuts the RNA from anywhere in the chain. So if they are these enzymes are there, they keep chewing and your mRNA is not working. They are not producing or they are not delivering any message to the workforce of the cell that is protein. So, so we propose here to stabilize the mRNA and how, we, how can we sta stabilize the mRNA? So there are two points where we can stabilize it. One, if we change the culprit, if we remove the culprit at the two prime OH, then we might able to save the mRNA. Second, the effector point, the phosphate backbone, which is getting actually break down, right? So we can modify these two positions and could stabilize the mRNA. So we propose that if we step, if we change this to prime OH to two prime fluorine or two prime OCH3, or if we change this phosphorodiester bond with alpha S and TP, which will become phosphorothiod bond. And then as a normal protein, which as a normal cell in which mRNA protein expression is happening, where would be modified mRNA will give you higher protein expression in any kind of specific disease that would lead in the treatment of a patient. With that, my summary says that mRNA is a very important genetic molecule which actually delivers all the messages from DNA to the workforce of the cell. Second, mRNA is very stable, unstable, and labile molecule due to 2 prime OH. Third, the modifications in 2 prime OH and phosphodiester bond can help to stabilize the mRNA, which could further help, help us to treat the genetic diseases. Thank you. And I welcome any question from the audience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tina. That was really excellent and, um, and, and it was really uh, in informative. So if, if folks have questions, uh, they can put it in the chat, but uh, we also have some questions um, that, that we, can, we can start with. And then if people have questions in the chat, then, then we can address those later. Oh, actually there's, there's one right now. Um, uh, have you tested if these modified RNAs can be translated? Yeah, that's a good question. And that's the question I would like to answer actually. I have checked with alpha SNTP and I got some positive and negative responses. Yes. And this cool. is the main lying up question. That's great, Nina. So cool. One, and one, uh, oh yeah, go ahead, Tina. Was one more good? time, just how we can stabilize mRNA. One more time, just how we can stabilize mRNA. Sorry. I think no, you're okay, so maybe, to clarify. Yeah. yeah. How can we stabilize mRNA? Can you explain that again? So it's like if we if you change the two prime OH, which is a main culprit, which actually degrades the mRNA, then we can just stop degrade degradation of the mRNA, right? So now two two prime OH is not there. Mm -hmm. So you can stabilize it. It would be less, less degraded by normal nucleases. And like phosphodiester bond actually gets cleaved. And if you change that with sulfur, so it won't be doing that. It would be stopping with from degradation. Does COVID vaccine need and, to- And Tina, so yeah, maybe we'll just ask one more question and then we'll move on. Um, but yeah, why don't we, uh, the, the, the COVID question is a good one. So can you talk about how, um, cause we've all heard about these Pfizer and Moderna mRNA vaccines. Can you talk a little bit about how, like how they actually work? Like how do they use mRNA to develop a vaccine? Uh, I would say they actually injected, they made modified mRNA, which has a similar sequence uh, of, uh, of a protein which actually encoding a 
protein, but not a full sequence. It's not fully active. And that the injection of that mRNA and produ production of that um, protein could help to bring antibodies in the human body. So then those antibodies can help you to rescue from COVID-19. Cool. Okay. Thank you so much. So I, I know there's still questions, but maybe we can address them later if there's time. Um, but but for the moment, um, you know, let's all uh, thank Tina. Uh, you can actually in the reactions you can do a clap emoji. Um, so so why don't people do do a clap emoji uh, to 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 applaud Tina? Um, so Tina, actually, you can also stop sharing your screen. Awesome. So um, and. Uh, D, I guess you can start sharing your screen as well. Cool. Okay. So now we're on to second round of trivia, which will be B trivia, actually, because Nina's, uh, Nina's talk will be about bees. Um, so let's do the first question. Do all bees sting? What, what do you all think? Oh, people are flying. They are. Oh man, okay, let's, let's, right. let's wait a second more, uh, see if anyone else joins. Maybe not, okay, so uh, maybe we'll end polling. Almost everyone said no. So Nina, is that correct? It is correct, I guess it's too easy. Um, not all bees sting. Um, in fact, none of the males can sting because a stinger is an ovipositor, it's what the females will lay eggs through, and so no, not a single male bee can sting you. So you can grab them like you said. Wow. Okay. Cool. I will. I will try that. Maybe if I'm feeling bold. <laughs> Do it. I love. I love holding the the bees. You can tell, and in, in some instances, really easily. Incredible. Oh, <laughs> you're brave. You're brave, bone veteran. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Our second you. question. Oh man. Okay. This is an even 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 scarier one. Maybe. Do bees that sting you always get their stinger ripped out? What What do you, What do you What do people think? Ooh, we got an even split. You guys can't see what we're seeing, but ooh. It's competitive, yeah. Some debate. <laughs> All right. Okay, okay, I think that's good, yeah. So majority, no, but you know, it, there's some debate. So, so Nina, what's, what's the answer? The, the real answer is that um, no, not all bees that sting you get their stingers ripped out. That's a honeybee thing because honeybees have a huge colony and they're willing to, to die for the colony. But other bees like bumblebees, they can sting you multiple times. Fascinating. So when I'm holding a male bee, I will not choose a, <laughs> or I guess it doesn't matter because they don't sting. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so third question, how do bees carry their pollen? Do we think all on right. their legs, on their bellies, inside their bellies, all of the above? I feel like I jumped the gun on on, po on the poll question. All it's good. a lot easier to manage polls when you're not the one. Like <laughs> 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 yeah, honeybees get their, the, their stingers ripped out because when that gets ripped out, it can continue pumping the venom into you. So it pretty much allows it to have as much venom into you as possible in comparison to just like a sting, single sting that is just like a little bit of venom that comes out. So that's a point. That's the why honeybees uh, do that. Fascinating. Okay. So I think we can end the poll, D. So it looks like the majority of people say all of the above. Is, is that nice. right? Nice. Yes, nice. that is correct. The majority of people are right. A lot of the bees that you think of, they carry their pollen on their legs, like bumblebees and honeybees. You see those big old pollen pants. Um, but then a bunch of a uh, major group of bees called megachylids, the leaf cutters, they carry them on their bellies, um, like on that middle photo. And the last one, um, these Kalitidae masked bees, they carry their pollen inside of their stomachs in like a little crop, just kind of like how birds have a crop too. So all the above is correct. Okay, I didn't know about the inside the belly. So do they like, I don't know, do they like vomit the pollen onto, oh, yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> He's straight up, she just said, you get up. <laughs> honey no what do you idea. think honey is <laughs> yeah so <No>, right <laughs> are all bees vegetarian meaning they only eat pollen and nectar let's find out what people think Ooh. neck yeah. and neck it's competitive i don't know if we're biasing the results by saying that it's competitive <laughs> <laughs> Uh, All right. Ooh, a full split. Ooh, full split, yeah. nice. So the answer.
answer is no, not all bees are vegetarians. There are these vulture bees that um, specialize on eating rotting meat. So most bees are, but bees are also a, actually a type of wasp. Bees are nested within wasps evolutionarily. And so all wasps, uh, that's not true. Most wasps are uh, eat meat, um, but bees evolved to be um, pollen eaters. But then some of these little creeps have uh, gone back <laughs> to the ancestral state and started eating meat again. Creepy. Cool. Meepy. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Where do bees sleep? Uh, inside flowers, on twigs, in their hive, or all of the above? Dee, if you were a bee, which of these places would you sleep in? <laughs> oh, flowers, a little petal, a little petal, petal pillow. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely, Nina agrees. And it just smells good all the time. All right. That's a good point, yeah. You can just eat. You can turn over and start oh, eating immediately. Oh, yeah, like like my fat <laughs> cat. You're like, I oh, don't well. <laughs> All right. So all of the above is that is that right, Nina? That is correct. Yeah. So most um, bees are solitary, meaning that they don't actually have a hive to go sleep in. The social ones do like to sleep in their hives, but the solitary ones they'll take a snooze together in a flower or hold it onto a twig, as this um, parasitic bee up here is doing. So all of the above is correct. You'll find them snoozing uh, all over the place. Cool. And then I think this is our last one. Yep. How many types of bees are there in the world? 20, 200, 2,000, 20,000. This is like how many types of fungi, you know, it's like, <laughs> bazillions and bacteria how many different strains of bacteria lots and lots lots and lots all right let's see what we okay, got let's and close that. last one okay nice a majority of people were right again um so there are over twenty thousand species of bees in the world um and the honeybee the european honeybee that we know of is just one of them cool. all right thank you so with that Want to go that, ahead and I think we will introduce, yeah, so let's introduce Nina, who we've just heard from, but we'll properly introduce her. Um, so Nina Sokolov is a graduate student studying disease ecology in the Boots Lab at UC Berkeley. Her research focuses on monitoring viral dynamics in honey and native bees uh, through time in California. She studies the transmission of viruses between different bee species and the effect of migrating honeybees for almond pollination on disease dynamics in bees. Additionally, she's passionate about natural history illustration and science communication. So Nina, if you want to start sharing your screen, you can take it away. I also want to mention we haven't yet mentioned our themed cocktail. This might be a good time to chat about that, Nina. Yeah, uh, so the themed cocktail, although it might sound a little gross, is called a, a mite Russian, um, a derivative off of a white Russian. Um, and I'll talk to you kind of, I'll begin the presentation with why I chose that. Um, the ingredients for it are on the Eventbrite page and on our Twitter. Um, but with that, I'll get um, started. Yeah, my, my roommates and my cat are all represented here in Cat Magulix. Oh, <laughs> no. those are your roommates? Yeah. I was just like, wow, that's really bringing in the crowds. I don't, I didn't realize that those were your roommates. Oh, hi. And my cat who got kicked out of here because she would start screaming. <laughs> okay, with that, can you see my screen? Yep, okay. Yes, indeed. Sweet. Um, so thank you so much for the great introduction and for giving me this opportunity to rant about bees and their diseases with you all. As Vetri said, I'm a disease ecologist, therefore I'm interested in understanding how diseases exist within an ecosystem. Specifically, I specialize in honeybees and native bees and their viruses. And so that's why I'm gonna be talking to you today about the bees disease, how do bees get sick? Again, you're probably all pretty familiar with the fact that bees aren't doing the best. Um, there are these news stories such as this one where honeybees are dying at alarming rates. So why is that? And why did I call the drink a mite Russian? 
Um, that's because of this nasty little parasite that I want to talk to you about. When this uh, parasite hit the scene, it caused a lot of trouble for the beekeeping industry as a whole. Um, this mite is called Varroa destructor. It um, started parasitizing honeybees pretty recently and it got to the US also in semi-recent history. As you can see in this image, they're pretty huge. And so it would be like having something the size of a dinner plate on you sucking up your fat and blood. Um, but not only are they drinking up the bee's fat body, they are also um, transmitting viruses to them when they parasitize the honeybee. So just as a mosquito can bite you and transmit pathogens to you, this mite is also transmitting pathogens to honeybees. And so a lot of the viruses and that uh, honeybees were infected with kind of this whole time have suddenly started to become a lot more dangerous, a lot more deadly for honeybees. And so this mite is in quite a in bit responsible for a lot of the declines that we're seeing. So overall, we are beginning to understand how uh, honeybees and bumblebees are doing. We're beginning to understand some of their losses, um, but these are just very well studied species that we got to remember. Um, but overall, as you guys all alluded to in the previous trivia questions, there's so many other bee species in the world, including 1600 different species of bees in California. And for all of those, we know virtually nothing about them and how they're doing. Um, so all of these photos are of the beautiful diversity of bees that we have in California, um, except this one, don't be fooled, like a lot of my undergrads are when we go out sampling. This one's actually a bee mimicking fly. Um, but every single one of these other ones are a type of bee. Even these ones that kind of look like a wasp and they're really tiny or even the ones like these metallic green ones that could look like a fly um, from farther away. And this one's a boy, the, the bright orange one in the top left. So you can grab that one <laughs> if you see it. Uh, so with this, we know that they're declining, but why is that happening? It is complicated because it's all of these different components happening um, in different ways in different places. So it's climate change, it's habitat fragmentation, it's stress, pesticides, poor diet, and disease all in one big ball uh, that's, occur that's impacting different bees in different ways in different places. And so with this talk, I'm going to be focusing on disease because that's my specialty. Um, here's images of me in the field. I am collecting honeybees with a pair of tweezers as they return back to their hives, shoving them in a tube um, before bringing them back to uh, Berkeley in order to do analysis on their viruses. So for my field work, I get to work in a lot of cool places. I get to work in the almonds, as was alluded to before. I get to work on cattle ranches throughout Marin. And this is all in uh, the Sierra, just north of Truckee. Um, all in part of monitoring their viruses through time. And so I'll talk a little bit about honeybees first to kind of figure out how honeybees are doing as a whole. Um, during the 2018 winter, an estimated 38% of managed colonies in the US were actually lost. Um, and so these are pretty staggering numbers, right? If almost 40% of all cattle in the US died over one winter, it would be you know, a huge disruption to the agricultural system, right? But that doesn't actually happen to be the case. We have these huge losses, but we don't actually have these massive impacts on our, our agricultural system. And the reason for that is that we can do this method called hive splitting. And pretty much is what it sounds like. You take one big strong hive, and at certain timing, you have to be pretty specific with the timing, you split it and make two hives from that. Um, and due to that method, we can actually uh, supplement and not have these massive losses. So they are dying over the winter, but beekeepers are able to manage and able to maintain the numbers by having strong hives that can make, make it through the winter. Um, not to say that this isn't a huge stress, it still is unfortunate and a, and, and a chore and, and a stressor to be able to have to do all of these things to maintain the numbers, but we are able to maintain the numbers that way. Uh, with this, we see, um, this is the trends of honeybee numbers worldwide. On the x-axis, we have the time from 1961 till 2017. And on the y-axis, we have the millions of honeybee hives. So as you can see here, in, that, in the past 50 years, honeybee hives have increased in number by 45%. So with that, you know, what's the, what's the concern here? You know, this, this, we're managing to split them, we're managing to increase their numbers. But the problem with this is that the fraction of crops that depend on some amount to animal pollination have risen by 300% in that same amount of time. What that means is that the crops that require a bee to pollinate them in order to make fruit 
have been increasing in a large demand um, in the same 50 years. So the problem is that we might not be able to meet the demands um, for crop pollination at this rate. Um, so that's the honeybee side of things. Now I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about the wild bee side of things. Here is Bombus affinis. This is kind of the poster child for endangered uh, insects in general. Um, and that's because it has really clear data where we see that it has decreased by 90% in abundance and distribution since the 90s. Um, and so because of that, it was listed as endangered um, back in 2017. Overall on the IUCN red list, we see that a quarter of the 47 native North American bumblebee species are under threat. Um, zooming out and looking at the European data that we have, um, which consists of 1900 species on their list, uh, as we can see, 60% are data deficient. So it shows that we really don't know how so many species are doing, but of the 1900, um, 77 species are known to be under threat. So I, I want to kind of just emphasize the difference in the issues that we're facing here. There are the honeybee issues, which are a management issue. We can think of them as livestock because they are important in agriculture here. Um, but we got to remember that they are not native, meaning that they were, did not evolve here. They are not from uh, North America at all. They are the Western, the European honeybee. Um, and so they're very, very important for crops. Alternatively, on the other side are the native bees, where this is a conservation issue. Uh, we have very little data, but the data that we point towards certain groups show that they're you know, at risk and declining and don't have any management to help them out. Um, they are native, which means that they are critical to, um, to native plant and flower reproduction. With this, we gotta remember that not a single plant in North America needs a honeybee in order to pollinate it. Um, but it does need, some of these you know, animal pollinated flowers, of course, um, do need the native bees there to pollinate them. Um, so these two different issues, agricultural issue and a conservation issue. In summary, honeybees face large overwintering losses in part due to Varroa. Um, honeybee numbers are increasing due to our ability to hive split, but the concern is that these losses are still terrible and that we might not be able to match the pollination demands. And honeybees could be this kind of canary in the coal mine if they're not doing well. And even with all this management, how are all these other things gonna do well? And finally, we don't know how most other bee species are doing, but some species are highly threatened and that is a problem for native flowers. With my research, I'm interested in kind of this big question of whether or not um, disease transmission between managed bees and native bees is partially responsible for some of these declines. I'm gonna talk a bit about pathogen spillover, which before COVID was kind of something I needed to really explain, but now we're living in it, um, where there can be disease transmission of new, um, in this case, viruses from one species to another. We see that with COVID, we see that we got a new pathogen from another animal species. And that same thing is happening with bees, where we are starting to find um, all these sharing of viruses potentially, um, in my instances of looking at honeybees giving their viruses to other bees. Overall, there's a really big heavy focus on viruses. And why is that? That's because they can mutate really, really rapidly. And so when they get infecting a new host, they can potentially mutate to figure out how to exploit that host really easily. So they sort of have the highest likelihood of spillover occurring. Not to say that other spillover of other pathogens can't happen. It definitely can, but viruses are just kind of the worst uh, contender because of their high mutation rate. On this graph, we have um, these different acronyms for different B viruses. And I just want you to focus on the green line. Um, that is the number of species um, that all these different viruses are being found in. And so let's focus on deformed wing virus here. It is being found in now um, 19, over 19 different species of insects. And that's not only just bees, that's also cockroaches and ants as well. And the number is only growing. Um, this was in, back in 2016, so more um, research has come out since then. And overall, the concern is that by allowing managed bees to mix with wild bees, there's this potential for disease emergence via sharing contaminated floral resources. So what do I mean by that? How do bees get one another sick? How do different species get one another sick? Say we have this honeybee here. It is sick um, and is foraging on this flower. Um, remember, they have this new varroa mite that is making them even more sick than what they um, used to be. And it will come and forage on this flower. It will shed virus onto the flower. Um, I say cough, cough, but in reality, it's more like this. Um, because most of these things are fecal oral transmission, but I digress. Then an unfortunate 
uh, an unsuspecting bumblebee <laughs> comes by after the honeybee has left and then will forage on that same flower. And with the pollen and nectar that it's consuming, it could potentially also consume uh, infectious virus particles. And so just as if your roommate was sick and took a drink from a glass of water and then put it down, and then you walked by and you picked it up and you drank from it or something, then that is kind of the same sort of uh, way that these things get transmitted. Um, it's not directly, usually from direct interaction between the two of them, it's this um, what is called environmental transmission that occurs for this between species spillover. And so just quickly, here's a list of some of the major honeybee viruses. Again, we call them honeybee viruses because we found them in honeybees in the first place, but who knows the real origin? We're still figuring that out. Um, in total, we know 31 viruses, but that number just keeps growing. Um, I'm gonna focus on a few of them here. This one's called deformed wing virus, um, aptly named because it causes deformities when the adults emerge. Here we have black queen cell virus where the larvae that were destined to become queens never emerge and instead turn this black color and die off. And then here we have chronic bee paralysis virus, which is characterized by having hairlessness, shininess, shivering, and paralysis. The trouble with all this is that they don't really tend to fit into these molds a lot of the time. Um, they are called these names and these are kind of the symptoms are when, uh, when it's really bad. Um, but a lot of the time, dare I say most of the time, these viruses are very quiet and you wouldn't be able to tell that a bee is sick at all. And so they are um, infected, they are spreading virus, but they don't show any symptoms. And that's because in part due to this phenomenon that I'll describe to you called condition dependent virulence. So what do I mean by that? Um, virulence or how deadly the diseases are depend on part to the condition of the host. So let's see, in this first scenario, um, there's a bunch of lovely flowers, big diversity, lots to eat. There's one honeybee hive, it is sick, it's shedding virus into the environment, you know, just a little bit though, not too sick. Say a bumblebee comes by, forages on a flower, it gets infected. Um, but because it's not stressed out, it has enough food to go around, it's not competing with the honeybees, there's no symptoms and there's overall low virulence. Say there's this second scenario where the forage is not good, the flowers are, there's not much flowers to go around. There's now a bunch of honeybee hives. There's like lots of competition. They're really sick. Um, there's more virus being shed into the environment. They're, they're sick and overall there's more stress happening. In this instance, same bumblebee uh, goes and forages on it. It gets infected, but suddenly because it's more stressed, it's not able to mount as an effective immune response. And so in this situation, there's high virulence associated with being infected with the same virus as before. And so this is um, negative in the sense that it's harder to diagnose diseases just by symptoms. However, it's positive in the sense that we can do something about this. You know, We can provide an environment that is less stressful in order to um, help promote their immune systems as much as possible to help them uh, flourish into the future. So in summary, there are lots of bee viruses and even more to be discovered. Bees can get one another sick while foraging on contaminated flowers and how sick they get depend in part on their condition. And so quickly, um, what can you do to help? What can you do about this? You can help by um, making bees less stressed. <laughs> um, had too much fun making that. Uh, you can provide them nesting sites. A bunch of bees are ground nesters. They nest in the dirt. So you can provide them um, good nesting sites and twigs and everything, because a lot of them are um, uh, cavity nesters in, in tree holes and everything too, um, and in stems. <laughs> um, you can plant flowers that will bloom throughout different parts of the year. So it's good to have flowers that will be in your garden that are blooming in spring, summer, and fall, so they can have food throughout the year when they need it. Um, you can plant a diversity of flowers to meet their nutritional needs. Imagine if you were eating the same exact meal every day, you wouldn't be feeling very good. Um, so it's good to have some flowers that are known for being very pollen rich, some flowers that are good for being nectar rich, and other flowers even are starting to show that they have medicinal properties from these plant secondary metabolites that can help them fight off infections. So there's lots of stuff that you can do. Um, if you're interested in this, I have uh, collected a little um, sheet of resources that I, can, that I think Dee will share with you all at the end for you to be able to help uh, make bees less stressed. And with that, um, thank you. I'll take any questions. Thank you so much, Nina. That was that was so uh, fantastic. It was really well done and you know really informational. I found it really um, 
shocking how like so many of those things were like relatable to like our lives right now. I know, <laughs> and, it's gotten so much easier to communicate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so we're, we, we're running a bit behind, so maybe we'll do one question um, like right now, but then mm -hmm. we'll also do the, the group Q&A with, with everyone. Um, mm -hmm. so, so maybe the, the one question we can do now from the, from the chat uh, is the transportation of domestic bees for plant pollination a contributing factor to spreading disease to native bees? Yeah, so the, I, yeah, I, I work in the almonds. I'm specifically interested in how the almonds are impacting disease transmission. Overall, yeah, I, I can quickly, the answer is yes, <laughs> um, because, and the most egregious example of this is with almonds, because every year in February, the almonds bloom, and over 60% of all honeybee hives in the U.S. are transported to the Central Valley mm -hmm. to accomplish this monumentous uh, bloom, this pollination event. And then they go all over the country again. So it's this big mixing pot of all these different bees coming from all these different places and then going back out to all um, natural areas, also to other pollination events, et cetera. So yeah, it definitely um, introduces new viral variants. It moves them around more so than if, uh, if they, there was no migration happening at all. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um... So, so for, for now, maybe um, we'll, we'll go into the, the open Q&A. So Nina, you can actually stop sharing your screen and, and Dee and, and Tina, uh, why don't we all uh, come back together? Um, and, and maybe Dee, did you want to do some questions? Yeah, if, well, I was gonna ask if anyone wants to raise your hand, again, if you click that reactions button, if you want to actually ask your question to either Nina or Tina, I love, we got to always have rhyming names from now on after we did that. You can raise your hand and you'll, you should pop up to the front, but otherwise let's ask Nina one, uh, another question. Um, let's go into the Q and A or was there a question from the chat that you read Vetri? Um, yeah, so, so this is one, uh, is the entire colony at risk if one social bee, a very you know, extroverted bee has a virus? Yeah, so pretty much when I'm working with 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 social bees, I'm kind of assuming that if one of them has it, the rest of them will get it. Um, especially honeybees, well, all of them really, the social ones. They do this behavior of trophallaxis where they're passing food between one another's mouths, literally. Or there's a lot of manipulation of the the honey, the the pollen into the jelly and everything. There's a lot of interactions both directly and, and kind of intimately. And so if, if one of them is sick, then probably the whole hive is gonna get sick. I see. Let's ask Tina a question. And I, I like that question we got at the end. So does the COVID vaccine have to keep be kept cold because of the mRNA break, breaks down so easily or is that a different reason? Do you know, Tina? Uh, I really don't know the answer of this question, but I would suggest all the genetic molecules we usually keep on ice, even like when we are working, uh, because if you keep at room temperature, it would degrade easily. So genetic, these cellular molecules, either it's DNA, DNA is pretty stable, so you can keep it at room temperature, but for a longer time, you need to keep uh, you need to keep it on the ice or like, you know, lower temperature, but uh, mRNA and proteins, they are always on ice. And if you want to save it for longer term, we can keep in minus 80s even. So, yeah. Uh, but I would suggest to read the, you know, terms and conditions on the, given on the uh, vaccine uh, wrapper kind of, yeah, box. Yeah, that, that's the main I would suggest. Yeah. Nina, we got a really key, a really quite a question I like, a cute question. Have you developed an emotional connection? My bees? Yeah. 100%. Yeah. yeah. Do you feel <laughs> of sorry? That's what drives me forward, you know? <laughs> I've, I've definitely cried at the sight of how cute a bee was before us. Aww. Yeah, fully. Do you There's some really cute ones out there. It <laughs> makes you sad when they're sick? I mean, like I said, I mean, yeah. I, I'm not like often seeing ones that are super sick, but sometimes I do see the ones with the deformed wings and they're just like, they last like a day, you know, like a, a bee that can't fly is not, is no bee at all, you know? And so you can see them outside of the hive entrance sometimes and you're like, buddy, yeah. Um, yeah. 
Vetri, you want to go ahead and ask Tina? Yeah, so, so um, Tina, there was a question that was interesting. Um, so when you're, um, uh, when you're replacing the two hydroxyl groups, um, can you replace it by like any other chemical? Like, is there a reason that, that fluorine is, is, the, is the right thing to replace it with uh, or are there multiple candidates? So I'm pretty sure there are multiple candidates, but it's sometimes difficult to synthesize. Uh, and these two prime fluoro and two prime methoxy have been used earlier. That's why we chose for mRNA as well. Uh, but yeah, the the another chemical which is to be re replaced, it should not be like re very reactive, right? Otherwise, there won't be any use of replacement. Fluoro, fluoro is a very inert molecule if you think about periodic table. So for that reason, yeah. Cool, cool. Um, great. So uh, I guess another question for, for Nina, um, this is a nice one from the chat. What makes a good nest? Like what, uh, yeah, like what are you trying to um, uh, have in a good nest? Yeah, so in the, in the resources that I shared, um, that were shared in, in the um, link, there's some really great resources for that. Um, for one, most bees nest in the ground. And so actually having patches of dirt that are kind of barren, I think mulch is not great. Um, I think that they can get through a certain level of mulch, but actually just having bare dirt there is really good. And sometimes you'll start to see like a bunch of holes clustered together, start to form in your dirt. And maybe you thought that that was like an ant or something, but in fact, that's um, uh, native bees that will, will start digging their own holes. So having bare exposed dirt is very helpful. Um, and in the link for the ones that all nest in, in our stem nesters and cavities, um, one, one really great tip is that if you have a garden, um, you shouldn't um, clip things back and you shouldn't um, throw out leaves or like clip back the dead, um, your dead flower heads or anything until it's kind of warm enough in the spring. I think the rule is over 50 degrees um, Fahrenheit for a consistent amount of time because there's little baby bees sleeping in there. They're overwintering in there. And so if you're gonna clip those off um, in the middle of winter and just throw them out, um, throw them into a compost bin or something, um, there's very frequently yeah, baby pollinators of all kind in there. So I highly recommend to just be lazy in your garden, totally like leave it for a little bit until it's warm enough in the spring. Then you can clip things back and you can um, throw right away your leaves and stuff like that. Oh, interesting. Okay, cool. Dee, did you want to ask a couple questions? Yeah, actually, I'm just going to close us out with questions about Nina and Tina, about how you became scientists or why you're, you chose the field that you did. I think it's so interesting. There's probably some young, young folks on here or people who are deciding on their careers. So what led you to this field, Tina? Um, so I have been always interested in translational science. Mm -hmm. There are two reasons. One is my basic, my uh, my personal reason that my father has a retinitis pigmentosa disease, which I always feel like we should have some kind of um, therapy to that, although we don't have. So I, I can feel like there's so many diseases to which we don't have therapy. So mm -hmm. if I can contribute somewhere, so that would be great. And another, I think it's my personal way to give back i would say uh, i have taken so much from this universe this word uh, so i think that's a small effort from myself to this community yep me too what about you nina um i mean i always knew that i wanted to study animals to some degree even from being really tiny um and then when i got i knew it Zoology was great, um, but then that hasn't been as much of a thing. So then I studied ecology and evolutionary biology. Um, I took an entomology class and started illustrating insects for the first time. And I just saw how beautiful they were. And I was like, whoa, you know, like these guys are crazy, you know? Um, so I knew I wanted to study insects. And then from there, it took a little while to narrow it down. And I really didn't know that I was gonna study bees until I got here actually. Um, but then for whatever reason, my brain really likes and thinks post-parasite things are fascinating. 
Um, just any of those kind of ecological interactions are really cool. So I wanted to study bugs and then I wanted to study their host parasites. And then I would ideally not want to have my research be to kill them, such as with mosquitoes or something. So the bees are what we're trying to keep alive and, and melds all of my interests together. Yeah, and you've taken an interest in science communication and policy because of this sort of misinformation about bees, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's the people are intrinsically interested in bees, um, which is great. And so that leaves a lot of room for communication and talking about them and talking about the, the science and everything. And I think I feel very fortunate for that. Um, and there's a lot of public. I can, you know, rant for days <laughs> about bee things. And yes, people now, want to listen. It's crazy. <laughs> I'm going to share not only the video and your resources, but I want to see if your some of your illustrations. That would be really cool um, to get a handle on those bugs you're drawing. So yeah. before we sign off, I just want to say I hope to see everybody at our next Grounds for Science uh, on April 8th. Um, we have cardio cardiovascular disease and PTSD and engineering viruses for therapeutic development. We also have uh, two Science at Cal lectures, one in March and one in April lined up. Um, the one in March is in about three weeks, two weeks. And then we actually have a um, Midday Science Cafe next week on quantum information science and then water energy nexus in April. So we have a lot coming up in the next two, two months. We hope to see you there. And I just wanna say thank you from Science at Cal Vetri, thank you for being here. Nina, thank you for being here. Tina, thank you for being here. All the rhyming names, thank you for being here. And thank you to our audience for being here. And we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye, everyone. <laughs>